Hey everybody, this is Tanisha Brown, founder and editor-in-chief of Impact Magazine. And I'm coming to you today because we're always talking about how we can make change. And one way to make change is through politics and changing laws and get your voice heard. And I'm sitting here today with Utah's first black woman. Yes. State legislator. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm in the room with a big deal, okay? So I wanted to sit down and talk to Miss Sandra Hollins about all the things she's doing. And she's not only just protecting Black women, but she's protecting Black people here in the state and getting things done. And that is the biggest thing that I love is to get the job done and don't continue year after year and after year without having any kind of progress and you don't been in this position just letting it happen yes ma'am so i'm excited to talk with you today so you done came to utah and busted it up mm -hmm. hailing from louisiana yes tell me about that culture shock transition from louisiana to utah yeah, it was a big cultural shock. My husband and I moved here in the very early 90s, like mm -hmm. 89, 90. And when we moved here, um, it, we were so excited to see other Black people. We would be driving down the street and just wave out the window when we saw Black mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But even more shocking was um, I wasn't even able to buy hair care products when I first moved here. Um, a lot of my hair care products I had to, when I went and visited home, I would pick them up. I would have someone from Louisiana ship that those products here. And so it was a big cultural shock. <laughs> wow. Wow. So as the years have gone on, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about when you're saying uh, you see people and you're like, hey, I'm doing that myself. Like, and we're in 2023. <laughs> I see a black person. I'm like, hey, family. Like, and they like, yes, they, they are so like, excited to see someone that looked like them and to address them as family. Yes. So since being here, how has the population grown? Because I think I just went to the chamber, Salt Lake Chamber, um, Utah County uh, Commerce mm -hmm. and Chamber of Commerce. And they were talking about how it's 4% now with the population of black people here in Utah. So from then till now, like what are some of the changes that besides hair that you've seen come through here? You know, some of the biggest changes I've noticed is that we are now attracting black businesses mm -hmm. and we are attracting a black professional community mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have come to realize that, you know, Utah is a very um, has a very strong economy, number one. Right. And um, and that makes for, you know, a, diff a decent living wage here. Yes. And so you have these opportunities here in, um, as the black community that you may not have in other communities. And so that has been some of the changes that I have known, I have noticed is, you know, black business are thriving, they're growing here, the professional community is growing here. And so it, it's been good. It's been good to me and my family. Right, and what made you get into politics? Because in your former life, you're a social worker. So how did that, how did that lead up to politics? You know, it's simple. I have always been very active in my community. Anything that's going on, I was very active. And I decided to run for office simply because I was asked. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we as women, and especially Black women, um, we don't think about politics as an option when we're thinking about careers. Right. And so I had the former legislator who was in this position, she actually came to me and she said, I just kind of noticed that you're always in the community and how the public reacts to you. Have you ever thought about politics? And my first reaction was absolutely not. I am not going into politics. But then when I started thinking about it, the big difference I can make and me being a social worker, I know what I know because I've actually been on the street because my my main um, concern or main focus was the homeless population. Right. And so I know what I know about this population because I've actually worked it. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking about all of that and how I can represent the black community and be a voice for the black community, I said, absolutely, let's mm -hmm. do it. And being a voice, you have done some major, major things. I have. I have done some major things. You know, 
I was I have I was able to make Juneteenth a ho state holiday here. Um, I banned the knee on the neck after the murder of George Floyd. I banned that here. I've been doing some work around student resource officers in our school system. I passed the Izzy bill. We know we had a little black girl die by suicide. And so I passed the bill in her name to collect that data to see exactly who is being bullied in our school. So I I'm trying to <laughs> to do some bills that's going to have a big impact, not only the people who elected me, but also the black community. Just period. Yes. And people don't understand like the importance of passing these bills specifically that specifically helps the black community and let alone being a black woman but why is that so important to you because people will say out in the front like we've had some presidents and everyone said well i'm not going to specifically focus on the black community so why is that important to you i'm i'm saying black people black politicians absolutely right? absolutely i've heard it. you know i've i've come to realize when i was elected that i am not only the representative for district 21 but i am the representative for the black community here um, because I've had people all over the state who have called me and I'll say, well, did you contact your representative? And they'll say, yeah, you are my representative. I don't care who's up there because they feel that I can understand and I can relate to, to the issues, whatever they are having. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I embrace that. I know that there are some people that don't embrace that, mm -hmm. um, but I embrace that. I embrace that. And it's a he heavy lift, but it's not one I mind carrying mm -hmm. at all. Now, what advice would you give to anyone looking to get into politics? Because um, it's a different thing that we don't think about. You know, we think about politicians being, you know, old white men. You know what I mean? And we don't like I remember being young and our mayor, um, Doug Palmer, he was the mayor for like forever. And he was a young man. And now he's head of the Democratic something. But I'm just saying, just being in politics at such a young age, like what advice would you give to someone that's looking to do and to be into politics? You know, I would tell people that to jump into it with both feet, mm -hmm. that it is if we're not at the table making decisions, people are going to be making decisions for us. Right. And so it is very important that we be at the table. And not only that, one of the things I'm proud of is that little black girls see me. Right. Uh, people have wondered why I wear my hair like this um, or, or wear braids at the Capitol. And it's because I want little black girls to see themselves right. in me. And so I think we need to start at a young age, um, um, letting little girls know that this is a this is a career path for you right. and something to look at. So um, we all have a voice. We all have a lens in which we look through things. And it's important that politics is one of them. That is so amazing. And you know what? Uh, Novi Brown, she plays on Sisters. Mm -hmm. And she is very adamant about wearing her natural hair everywhere, anywhere that camera is at. She said because to, for Black girls to see, then they know they can be themselves, number one, and that is attainable. And to show that it is attainable is like the, the best thing because as a child, I don't, rem I didn't even think about politics at all. Yeah. But seeing someone like you looking like me, then I can believe that it is attainable. So being able to be, all right, what is like the first step of it being attainable? Like, how do I go and say, okay, I'm being politics, which way should mm -hmm. I navigate? You know, first of all, find out how do you want, what, what role you want to play in politics. Not everybody wants to be out front. Not right. everybody wants to be Sandra Hollins. <laughs> right. And I realize that, but there are different roles in politics. For some people, it's working behind the, more behind the scenes. Maybe your thing is being a campaign manager or volunteering or working on a campaign. Maybe your thing is to lobby. Right. to be up there lobbying for different bills um, to pass or not pass. So look at what role you want to play okay. in politics, you know, and there are so many different roles there. And also look at maybe at the school board level, maybe the city level. Mm -hmm. Look at what you want to do and what role you want to play, and then that's where you, you start. I love it. So any advice 
to someone who is in a city with a population of people who do not look like them and you have a small population of people who do look like you like what advice would you give to them who are seeking to make change you know i would say find people who are like-minded Mm-hmm. Find people who want to make those changes, the same changes you would like to make. And sometimes though people will look like you, sometimes they will not look like you. That's where our allies come in. That's where our friends come in. And get those people together and you all strategize. Start strategizing on what needs to happen, what changes you would like to make, and what policies you would like to change. And start there. Yes. Mm-hmm. And far as Black women, any, like... We talked to Dr. Baden about the disparities in health. Are there any, like, and we talked to uh, Amber, Mm -hmm. who is an attorney here. What are some things that is specific to Black women that you're working on right now? Sure. One of the things that I'm working on is a a piece of legislation around sickle cell. Mm. We know that sickle cell do exist in this state. Um, I had a uh, friend of mine lost her granddaughter um, recently to sickle cell. I've had parents come to me and say that they've had to go out of state to get treatment for sickle cell. Mm. And so that's one of the things I am looking at is starting to look at what needs to be done in this state that um, our children, um, so our children are able to get the health the health care that they need and have access to not only the medication that's out there, but we have some new medications that's coming out. How do we make sure that those parents have access um, to that and they're receiving the best treatment and our doctors are checking for it? Um, I was telling um, Dr. Ferguson the other day, I said, when I decided to start having children, it never dawned on me to first check to see if I had the sickle cell trait. Right. Never dawned on me. Right. And so that's one of the things I'm looking to change is to bring awareness to that and making sure people have access. I love it. <laughs> a true change maker. I'm so excited that you came here today to share some experiences and show that you ain't nothing to play with. So thank you for coming on with me and thank you for sharing with the audience and sharing a moment with me about how we can protect not only black women, but black people in the community as a whole. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) 